Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to evening three of the Learning Revolution Conference Online. This is our inaugural conference, bringing together thought leaders and practitioners in a variety of learning fields. We're so excited about this, and it's a thrill tonight to have David Lurcher here. David is a friend now, has become a friend, and he is one of the creators or the creator of the Learning Commons idea. I don't know, David, welcome, first off. Well, thank you very much, Steve. How much credit do you take for Learning Commons and how much was collaborative? Um, in the K-12 arena, we were the originators of uh, this whole idea. Um, it, uh, we were preceded in the academic uh, library world a, a bit, but they had a, quite a different uh, slant to their work. Uh, anyway. Well, we're sure glad that you have done what you've done. Thanks to ClassFlow and Blackboard Collaborate for their support of this event. Um, this is a labor of love, this particular conference. I'm just so excited about all that's taking place here. And I, Again, it's hard to uh, may sound like hyperbole, but I feel like this is sort of an historic opportunity to bring it, to bridge different worlds. Those of you who are in our live audience, thanks for being here. If you look to the left of the map, you'll see some icons. You're looking for the second one down. It's the star, and you can double click on it and click on the map. And then go ahead and put in your location. Look at that Indian New Zealand lovely in the Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. Look at that, two people from Asheville. What a coincidence. <laughs> Who knew? Hey, Sue, South Korea, how fun. You've made us quite an international group. We're small but mighty tonight. Feel free to keep that chat going. And David is an old hand in Blackboard Collaborate, and so do feel free to use the chat raise your hand, any other tools that you would like. He's quite an interactive fellow. So Dave, I'm going to turn the time over to you, and I'm going to stick here and make sure that if you need any help, which is unlikely, that I can provide it. OK, well, thank you very much, Steve, and welcome uh, to uh, those of you who are attending this evening. And, and uh, certainly glad to uh, uh, share my ideas with you. Now, I have very low vision, so if you, uh, so I can't follow the chat uh, uh, and what you're asking me there. So you'll just have to kind of raise your hand and hope your mic works. And uh, perhaps if, uh, if uh, somebody does have a mic that works, you can uh, uh, ask a question uh, in behalf of someone whose mic doesn't work. But anyway, so I would uh, love to be uh, uh, interrupted and uh, uh, we can ask questions. Tonight I thought I would uh, talk about the flat uh, co-taught teaching experiences, which is uh, not the norm uh, in, in the teaching world, but hopefully it, uh, uh, it, it could and ought to become a, a normal kind of process. So um, uh, the norm, of course, now is, is the top-down uh, teaching uh, uh, experience, uh, direct teaching, where the teacher sits at the top and uh, all the students are uh, <coughs> uh, responding to the directions of that particular uh, person. So uh, <coughs> there's definitely someone in command and you do exactly what you're told to do. So uh, we think of teachers who uh, are working on uh, content uh, the, uh, the, the mastery of content such as history or science or uh, <coughs> some uh, uh, art history or something like that. And uh, so um, what, and particularly in online education, we have all this packaging going on 
And of course, the way the online companies now are trying to make money is they design once, and then they teach many times. So they'll spend the money up front, and then amortize it over uh, a number of, of, of uh, users. And so uh, we think of, uh, so they'll provide the textbook, the lecture, the videos, or uh, they will provide all the content that is necessary for mastery of, of whatever is uh, being taught. And um, so they will, um, uh, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, they will then test so that they are certain that everyone uh, uh, masters the same amount of knowledge. And uh, that's easily tested because you know in advance exactly what the learner is supposed to have done. And then there are those uh, still in the top-down uh, pyramidal structure where we're trying to master a skill. That could be a reading teacher or uh, uh, a, an industrial arts teacher or an art, or art teacher trying to teach the skill of painting or a music teacher trying to teach you how to play the piano. And of course, they, uh, they teach a skill and then, you know, we as the students practice it and then we keep all the repetition keeping going. A math is uh, chug and plug and chug math is the same way. And then we can assess the results where we are on, on whatever skill is being uh, taught. So uh, <clears throat> once in a while, uh, top-down uh, direct teaching instructors let kids out into an, uh, an inquiry space. It's a little larger information space, uh, but often these turn into what I call verb units. And so they allow kids to uh, choose a topic, uh, and the kids uh, <clears throat> uh, create some sort of product, and then they um, they do some oral presentation, and they get a grade for that. So uh, I call them bird units because you could pick a bird, and so you have the the uh, robin person or the robin group. Uh, you'd have the woodpecker person or the woodpecker group, and uh, so they end up knowing a lot about the particular bird that they chose. Uh, but they don't know anything about birds in general. Now, theoretically, they should have learned that during the presentations, but <clears throat> um, I find that, you know, lots of learners go to sleep in presentations, and so it's, it's very difficult to have build general knowledge. Uh, I was looking at some uh, examples from a national organization who was trying to show uh, a short inquiry projects uh, that would fill the Common Core, uh, st new Common Core standards here in the U.S. And uh, the kids had uh, done <coughs> uh, little research papers uh, on a topic that they had chosen. And so, of course, as a librarian, I, I look at the uh, at the uh, um, the references at the end. And out of the three, three of the four outstanding papers uh, only quoted uh, material information from Wikipedia. And I thought, oh my, this is what inquiry is supposed to be. So uh, I think there, are, I read a, a lot of educational literature, and and it's all gauged to the isolated teacher in the isolated classroom, and. And this literature uh, tries to help uh, these teachers push up um, mastery. And it could be anything from, um, you know, classroom management skills or a problem. And if you just fix that, you'll, you'll uh, uh, more students will um, succeed. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, the techniques you're using. You could flip your classroom uh, so that you could get more individualized help. Um, all sorts of things, hundreds and hundreds of ideas uh, that are constantly coming out on the market, uh, you know, and are retreads from uh, things that we learned 10 years ago or whatever. So um, recently I've been conducting a research study that's funded by the American Library Association. And uh, uh, in, the, in the phase one of this, I asked a bunch of teachers just uh, 
uh, when they are teaching alone in the classroom, what, what percent of their kids uh, meet or exceed their highest expectations? For example, uh, who would, uh, how many would succeed at the top level of some sort of rubric or uh, in traditionally would achieve the A grade level? And I'm, I've only, I'm only about half way finished, so you're looking at just maybe uh, half of the data that's uh, going to come in. But uh, right now, it looks like about 54% of the students actually achieve uh, a teacher's highest expectation when that teacher is alone in the classroom. And that is so that, uh, you know, it's about half of your students who are uh, going to succeed, and of course everybody worries about this percentage rate um, because of whatever national tests are coming up, particularly the PISA, which is international, uh, you, you know, the U.S. scores, uh, you know, down quite a ways compared with other nations. And so but I thought this was an interesting figure. So. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. There's those sorts of learning experiences which, which are not going to go away anytime soon. And I don't think should go away. I mean, there's uh, there's a place for direct teaching, and but I'm going to talk about an alternative uh, that I, I think uh, has uh, in the 21st century is not only possible, but uh, uh, I think it's an urgent uh, agenda to put on on. Uh, education uh, uh, strategies uh, that are being uh, worked on. Anyway, so I'll call them uh, the flat and net network co-teaching experiences. And um, so what do I mean uh, by that? Well, first you realize that uh, kids of all stripes are now in all over the world or in this real world of networks. And that, uh, of course, has been uh, has an, a number of characteristics. And, and as soon as a kid gets a device and is connected, and not all kids are and teenagers, but as soon as that happens, uh, the potential of world-changing education uh, uh, immediately uh, happens, and the opportunities are great. So. Right now, everybody is saying, you know, um, we could, we have the opportunity to learn anything at any time um, that, that we want to. Uh, for example, uh, at a maker fair in New York uh, City, I uh, met this fellow who uh, he was taking his produce into New York City from New Jersey, his New Jersey farm, and uh, and he would sell it, and then on his way back out, he would collect uh, the uh, I uh, used uh, vegetable oil from McDonald's and other uh, other places, and uh, he would take it out to his farm. And then he had uh, he had this distilling mechanism that turned that used vegetable oil into the uh, fuel for his tractors. And I said to him uh, because he had a demonstration there uh, of all the jars of vegetable, dirty vegetable oil on one end and about 10 jars, uh, and the last one was the actual fuel that he could use in his tractors. And he described the molecular structure that was going on as the, the oil goes through. He could talk to any petrochemical engineer anywhere in the world, and I said to him, well, how on earth did a, a farmer, how on earth did you learn this? And he says, oh, on the internet. You can learn anything on the internet. So, you know, this is this is what's going on. And informal learning uh, is now starting to uh, worry uh, some people. What is the what is the future of formal education versus informal education? So, uh, let, let's take uh, pieces of this and just take a, a quick look. So, one of the uh, the major uh, pieces that we're looking at is the self-directed learner, who is like our New Jersey farmer. Uh, they're ready to put in the time and effort to learn what they want to learn because they have a reason to learn it right now. And uh, they will spend an inordinate amount of time and effort 
in learning something that they actually want to. And uh, there are really, uh, as I look at this, uh, you know, what are we trying to develop in the self-directed learner? And the first thing is what I would call personal expertise, and that's always been around. That in, in top-down uh, teaching, you're, you're working on the individual. What, how, what's their fluency re uh, level in reading? What's their math capabilities, et cetera? So every, every kid that's coming through any kind of education has to put something on the table and bring something to the workplace or to their future. And so uh, that's always been there, and, um, and it will continue to be there. It becomes even more important in a net flat network world because people are looking for solid, good advice or techniques or that they can trust. And so the person putting that out on the, uh, the world networks, you know, we're always looking for the best advice or the best things. And there's plenty of uh, junk and bad advice out there. Uh, the second level is the, the cooperative group worker. And this is the person who may work at McDonald's or could work in a factory. And they are in charge of one thing. And that is uh, putting the lettuce on the hamburger or, you know, uh, pushing the button on the french fries uh, and taking them off out of the oil at a precise uh, time. So cooperating means I take my piece and my, my lettuce has to be perfect because the, the product uh, must work and be, and, and be to specs. If I were working in an airplane manufacturing uh, uh, outfit, I would have to take my gear and it would have to meet absolute tolerance specifications because when it gets put into, you know, the engine or whatever, where it's going to go, it has to fit, it has to work, it has to be reliable, etc. So kids need to develop this cooperative group work. It is learning to build my piece and to add it to another piece and uh, the whole thing's going to work. But then there's another level which is, uh, which is not often built in K-12 education and it's the reason I think we're a lot of the most best and brightest like Thomas Edison and they failed out of school uh, because they're just so bored. And that's uh, what I call collaborative intelligence. This is uh, group work, obviously, but the product is not, is not the hamburger or it's not the, the precise uh, uh, piece that fits into an airplane. It is a new idea. It is true uh, innovation. Uh, it's the iPad. So, you know, uh, Steve Jobs did had a vague idea about an iPad, but he gathers around him this group of, of thinkers and doers, and together they build something that none of them could have created individually. In other words, they build off themselves, they, they combine their expertise, they build expertise together, and they come out with this, uh, with this new in, uh, invention. And I think the world is after this type of person. I mean, there will always be jobs for the cooperative uh, group work uh, person who can, uh, you know, put things together precisely. But more and more we need uh, people who are able to tackle the major problems of the world like hunger and water and, and um, uh, climate change and just to survive, etc. So there's the this whole world of self-directed learners is a different kind of uh, breed uh, than we are uh, uh, creating in the top-down classroom. So uh, another thing that's going on is this uh, the expanded information and technology environment. So this makes the flat world flat. Uh, because everyone, I mean, your location, the location you have, the physical location, fades, 
uh, as you start making connections to other like minds throughout the world. So, you know, why do we need, uh, you know, the question comes up, do we need brick and mortar schools anymore? And of course we do, but, but the opportunities to connect with people and, and the kids uh, all over the world is essentially here. Uh, and yet uh, we have teachers who, who are saying, well, within the confines of my uh, 30 students in my walls, I have to produce these master master uh, learners when when sitting the possibilities of, of expanding out into the world of information far beyond um, uh, the textbook. For example, you throw a textbook in front of you know 30 students and you got half in the class, particularly well here in the U.S. You've got you know maybe. A, 10, 15, 20 languages spoken. Uh, you've got kids all over the map as far as uh, their ability levels. And uh, you think if you throw a textbook at them, a single textbook, you know, you've already put a wall up uh, that, uh, you know, less than, you're less than, you'd be lucky to get 54% of your kids simply because the tools you use, uh, you know, could not be scaled by you know, a large group of your learners. And so suddenly the, the possibilities of providing all kinds of connections in various levels, types of information, uh, you know, differentiation, all that stuff uh, 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 exists. So another part of this whole flat thing is the, the, uh, the access to what I call co-teachers. That's two adults, at least two adults, uh, uh, working uh, simultaneously with a group of learners. And uh, uh, immediately uh, people say, oh, we couldn't afford to have two teachers in front of the classroom. Well, one of the, one of the best uh, secret or least known secrets about uh, Finland uh, education is they have a lot of co uh, situations where uh, there are two adults in front of the classroom. And uh, they, you think, oh, well, why don't we hear about that? Well, because nobody wants to suggest that that might be a reason why Finland is so high on the scale, because uh, our country couldn't afford that uh, kind of thing, to have two teachers. They can barely afford one and two. But however, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I visited the Maryland High School, and uh, they uh, they were doing, and, and I'm not going to tell you who they are, but I'll just tell you they're in Maryland, and they are in an urban uh, area, and so they have about 30 languages spoken, and they get every day somebody's coming in uh, uh, that doesn't know a single word of English. So uh, they have these huge challenges. So they were not doing well under the Bush administration's uh, uh, no child left behind, and so because they were such a failing school, they had to reorganize themselves. So that gave the, the uh, principal an opportunity to clear the deck. Uh, all teachers were fired, and uh, you had to reapply if you wanted to teach at that school. And that was a real boon because they wanted to uh, uh, really test out the idea of co-teaching. So they created about six classrooms. Uh, they're called uh, collaborative uh, teaching rooms. And in these rooms, you've got uh, either a, a language arts teacher or a math teacher. And then uh, the co-teacher in either one of those subjects is either a special ed or uh, an ELL, uh, a, a foreign language uh, uh, English is a second language, ESL, a teacher. So you've got two adults. One is kind of a specialist, and the other is a content specialist. And uh, so they, uh, they I, I visited their room, uh, rooms, and they do know how to co-teach. The kids have a hard time knowing which is the content specialist and which is the, um, which is the uh, uh, skill specialist, because they're both uh, working 
working constantly with uh, groups. And what they, um, you know, so they've been at this now six years, and this is what they say. Uh, six years ago, they had zero, zero of the uh, kids in trouble uh, pass any kind of, uh, these second language kids pass any of the tests uh, that were going on. And now, after six years and honing this, uh, these these classrooms, they have 20% uh, of the kids uh, coming from zero English to math competence, uh, uh, you know, passing uh, the, the year's test. Now that uh, <laughs> that that is pretty significant. Except the problem is they got extra funds to do this. And the more successful they, they get at it, the the, uh, <laughs> the fewer the funds are. So they're kind of in a quandary. What do we do, we do next? So this is an all year kind of thing. Um, and so I got to uh, interview uh, <clears throat> a few students in, who happen to be sitting in the library, and a, a table there were four <laughs> excuse me four kids during lunch. And three of them had been in uh, these kinds of experiences. And they said they are the best classes they have in the school. And of course, they get the logical reasons, because they can get more help, you know. And, and so because they can get more help, uh, they, they make a lot more progress and are able to do something. Of course, this is, you know, this is not rocket science, right? It just makes uh, sense. So. Uh, let's think about um, uh, these. Uh, uh, you know, there was a librarian in that same school, uh, but she has a different role. She uh, she co-teaches too, but she has to spread herself. She can't stay with one class all year long, like these others do. She has to embed herself. Uh, you know, in various classes across the faculty or teaching across the entire curriculum. So she's like other uh, other specialists in most schools uh, who might have uh, a teacher librarian or they might have a technology integration specialist or there could be something called the instructional coach or, uh, you know, there might be a reading specialist or even a counselor. So, you know, most schools have some sort of specialist who, and the thing that unites or is common among these people is they have, uh, they have responsibilities across the school and across the faculty. Uh, and so they can only make uh, a difference uh, as they actually embed themselves into learning your projects. Now, the problem with these people, <laughs> excuse me, the problem with these people is that they often have agendas of their own that um, take up a lot of their time. For example, the teacher librarian has the collection to worry about, has the space to manage, and all sorts of things. The technology integration specialist might have you know, machines galore all over the building, trying to keep them up and going, and the network's operational. The instructional coach might sit in on sit in on classes and then give uh, give recommendations and, and does reports of all kind. The reading specialist may take uh, kids uh, isolated into reading skill programs, so it doesn't really have time to integrate reading. Or, you know across the, anyway, so these people have other agendas. So how, how are you going to have these people uh, embed themselves and, uh, and why should they? Now, my argument for doing this is that when you combine a content specialist teacher with a, with a skilled, uh, um, a skilled specialist, you, you get this, what's happening in this uh, sort of model here. So uh, you've got the content uh, knowledge uh, in, in the kids uh, here. They, they, they come into a learning experience either totally uninformed and you're trying to push them toward deep understanding. Now you're going to get kids in, in all along that continuum. So if you've got my grandson, uh, 
uh, in your class. Uh, he would already be uh, at the right uh, here, and so you tell him what he has to know, and he already knows it, and and so he immediately you you have a problem as the teacher, and he has a problem with you because he's totally bored. Uh, on the bottom, you might have uh, our specialists who uh, are uh, specialists in teaching how to read, or librarians who are teaching uh, um, inquiry uh, kinds of things, so uh, how to find uh, really good information and what to do with it when you've found it, and, and how to use uh, various forms of technology to actually boost what you're doing. Uh, you know, uh, so. Uh, the, when you get a co-teaching pair of a content specialist and, a, and a, a process specialist together, what one does, what the, 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 uh, uh, the learning, uh, the skills on the bottom actually push up the content skills. So they're going to, uh, the idea is to use the skill to boost the actual content. Uh, that is uh, outlined to learn, and when you know the best time to learn something, the best time to use a skill is when you're trying to learn something, and then you know you get uh, better results. Uh, at least that's the theory, and it works most of the time, and not always. But uh, so right, let's go back to our little study. So we ask uh, we ask teachers and teacher librarians in our study. Uh, when you co-teach together, take an actual sample unit. What were your, what were a, a few of your goals and objectives? And <clears throat> so, when you got through, uh, again, how many, uh, what percent of those learners that you had in that co-taught learning experiences achieved your highest level? So again, we're looking at the highest level of the rubric or the traditional kind of A level. Just look at the difference. I mean, remember, it was 54% when you teach alone. And, uh, and this is not the final, remember. This is only about half of the data in. <clears throat> uh, but look at the difference when you, uh, when you put two mentors uh, to work uh, in, a, in a group. Um, that is, I, I think that is, that's hugely successful. I mean, that is something worth shouting about uh, to everyone in the school, to parents, and even to the kids. So, you know, uh, what do you do with these specialists who you have uh, and who have agendas of their own? I have the recommendation that you have all the specialists in the school, the librarians, the reading specialists, the tech folks, can actually do uh, um, co-taught learning experiences uh, together uh, with 50% of their time. So if I were working an eight-hour day, uh, four hours ought to be spent in doing actual collaboration experiences because that you would then have this uh, track record of your impact on, on learning in, in the school. And so, for example, for librarians, it, you know, uh, shelving books and circulating them, uh, you know, it's not going to make two hoots a difference in, in the learning that's going on. But when you get involved with an actual learning experience and get those books off the shelves and read, and, uh, you know, uh, something is going to start happening in heads. And that's what you're all about. So you're trying to, to say to each specialist, don't tell me how to do it. Uh, walk with me. And we will not only collaborate, but we're going to document. And then uh, we're going to uh, collaborate again, and we're going to document again. And brick by brick, if, if one is successful at the 81% level, that's one brick. And I start building this track record among all the specialists in the school uh, until, uh, uh, and, and so you're saying to the faculty and to the parents, I mean, you've spent money buying us as specialists, and here's, here's the difference that we make. 
And so every time I touch a learning experience as a specialist, it turns to gold. And uh, we see the results that appear. So, um, uh, so here's a hint I have for all administrators, you know, around the world, and that is to to buy or hire these these uh, specialists who not only have skills but know how to actually collaborate and teach alongside and mentor kids and demonstrate that they're doing. That's what they did in the Maryland school, and. Um, they were able to make a, uh, you know, a huge impact. And, and if they found somebody who uh, they, uh, you know, spoke uh, in the interview, uh, uh, talked a great game, but then could not produce, they would say to that person, "Well, there's probably a different space for you, uh, you know, in education. It's just not in the kind of collaborative, collaborative participatory culture we have at this school." So they've grown this participatory culture school uh, on purpose and have, you know, the administrators uh, just push that and allow people to experiment and take risks and all sorts of stuff. So it's the people you hire that makes a huge difference. And of course, uh, uh, I, I recommend that you turn your library into a learning commons. And, the, and what is a learning commons? Well, it turns from a, just a storage and retrieval space and a circulation space of things into a very high level learning space so that uh, there are simultaneous projects going on in many little alcoves or uh, so the furniture all moves, everything moves so that you know, by at 8 o'clock in the morning, there might be one configuration of individuals, small groups, and large groups working uh, in this place. By 9 o'clock, it's a different physical uh, space uh, uh, because you can move stuff around. And so there's just, it's a very busy, productive space where all the specialists are, are officed. And this is where they do a lot of their actual co-teaching learning experiences, both here and in the various classrooms. So every teacher considers this uh, kind of uh, uh, as the extension of their classroom uh, where things are done, not just tended, uh, for example, kids coming for a half hour of uh, library time, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns this place. And there's an equal, uh, not only a physical place, but a very participatory uh, virtual learning commons that goes along with this. So instead of a, a library website that connects you into databases and this kind of a one-way stream, uh, you, you build this participatory culture uh, in, the, in the webs where all kinds of of uh, uh, learning experiences are happening and things are being built, et cetera, et cetera. Another hint I have to, to make this whole thing work is to really open up the technology. And we've gone through a phase, at least in the United States, where the tech directors just have locked everything down. So, I mean, they built this network and then they don't let anybody use it because they're afraid that it will be misused. So I say, well, why do you build it in the first place if you don't open it? But um, I think uh, we're really looking at, at uh, a, a different kind of person that's coming into uh, tech directorships, I think, now. We're getting a lot more educators rather than uh, the super systems uh, people. And, uh, when you get an educator in here, they start understanding how uh, you you open this and you open that and you allow bring your own device now is is uh, coming into its own so that every kid in the world who has a smartphone or even a even a regular phone can start participating in in uh, their education rather than you know uh, closing it all down. So uh, that's one of the major uh, uh, principles that has to happen if you're going to have flat instruction. 
Uh, there's there's also another thing that has to happen, and that's you do different kinds of instructional designs in a flat in a flat world than you would do in a top-down world. I'll just show you a couple and give you some examples. Um, what I call is a knowledge building center, and this is an online, it's just a Google uh, a Google site, and you could build it in any any sort of technology. It's not, it doesn't have to be. You can Google, um, just uh, if you want to see this template and draw it down and take a look at it, it's free. It's up on Google. Just Google Knowledge Building Center and you'll find what you see here on the screen. And it has different rooms. And in each one of these rooms, the, the kids, the, the teacher, the classroom teacher, and the teacher librarian, other specialists, maybe experts from the community can be working. The parents can be in here. And so, uh, and kids from other schools can be in here. So it's truly, you, you build this place where everybody can be learning and growing and constructing and sharing and, and figuring out and problem solving together. So uh, you can take this. Uh, on each one of the pages are some suggestions of what might go there, but you grab this and uh, get the idea and then uh, uh, create ones of your own. Another uh, flat kind of learning experience is what I call a book to cloud. And this is a place where curation happens. This is where you take a piece of text. Uh, uh, or a novel, or a, a, a document, or uh, something that is really a challenge, and and you uh, have uh, you divide it into small pieces, and have kids curate uh, as individuals or small groups. They curate around the piece, trying to teach everybody else in the room what what this particular their piece means. And then they put it all together. Uh, one example is Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address. And so uh, one of these book cloud, and again, you can Google this, and you can see all kinds of examples, and you can use them and, and create your own. But in Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address, what I did is I it took each phrase of that, of that address, which has meanings uh, in 1863 that the kids need to understand. And so each each phrase of that speech is in a different room. And that room is empty when the kids come into it. And it's their job to fill that room with ways to understand the significance of the phrase they were assigned. And then we put it all together so that we deeply understand a complex text or a novel, you know, chapter by chapter, or an idea, uh, you know, idea by idea that uh, goes on. Uh, so anyway, the, the notion here is to uh, curate and assign t for uh, individual students to take much more responsibility for teaching each other uh, pieces and parts. There's another one I created called Quick MOOCs. And here you see, uh, again, you can just duplicate, uh, you can du duplicate this uh, instructional design. When you come into this environment, uh, uh, you, uh, you come in and there's an umbrella question there. Like, um, you know, uh, what do we know about climate change? And so, uh, uh, you're, you're asking a whole body of students a, a major, a major question under which they can then build their own questions uh, that they are going to pursue either as individuals or groups. And then you take them into a, a getting started place where there's just enough overview or to build their background knowledge, uh, just enough to get them started, and that helps them build even better questions. So they're refining their questions as they go. Then you take them into the gallery where there are many rooms uh, uh, where they can work and find information and find all kinds of resources. And they participate in these rooms. It's not what 
I, the teacher, am putting there. It's what they are curating again into each one of these rooms. So these rooms are conversations and uh, places of, uh, uh, and they don't have to go into every room. They, because they are pursuing their own question, they might go into one or two or three of these rooms, but not the other. So choice is constant. And then they go into the workshop. What are they going to do now? What kind of a project or what kind of a, um, a product would they uh, create together uh, to uh, inform uh, the entire uh, class? And, and, and then you notice on the left there's this blog that's going on. And then they finally end this with a big think, a look back after they finished this big learning experience. You know, what did I learn? What did we learn? How did I learn? How did we learn? And that uh, is a fabulous model for doing these flat kinds of things. Uh, I, I'm going to go back. And one, I meant to put another slide in there, but I, I'm sure that all of you have encountered maker spaces. And again, make, the idea of maker spaces is this flat world. So you put a disruptive technology into uh, the Learning Commons, uh, former library, and it's a place where kids are building and constructing. And um, you know, you put a 3D printer in there, and you say, I don't know how to run it. Who's going to who's going to figure out what this thing does? Uh, and uh, so kids get around and start tinkering and. Uh, so, uh, you know, they go from uh, being users of a technology to tinkerers on a technology to an actual experimentation level on technology, and finally they become entrepreneurs. And, and so the whole idea in a makerspace is a really flat learning experience. Now, if I don't know it, who can help me do it? Uh, who has the knowledge to help? Uh, what do we need to construct, you know? It's all this stuff on robotics and, and uh, Arduinos and, and strawberry pies and, and all this sort of stuff that is uh, starting to make a huge difference in education. So uh, I see a hand. Uh, talk to me. Hi, David. It's Steve. So I thought I'd set an example and show people that they can raise their hand and, and, and ask you a question. I'm interested in the makerspace specifically as it relates to the tension between individual competency and achievement and collaboration. Because it feels like the maker fair sort of manifests both. And in some ways shows that individual study and competency and deep learning are kind of a prelude or a prerequisite to the collaboration. How does that match your model? Well, it matches perfectly because uh, what's happening uh, is as you're developing yourself and you're working on a problem with others, you know, you, you're developing simultaneously your own personal expertise because you have to go out and learn. When, when, when a problem confronts a group and nobody knows how, everybody has to go out and investigate. And, that, and you know, so everybody's building, you know, everybody takes on this project and they understand that everybody in the group has to work toward some sort of solution. So uh, th it's not a separate, it's not one thing you learn, you know, yesterday and you're prepared for today. It's, it's simultaneously working, building collaborative intelligence uh, along with personal expertise. So uh, these are not antithetical. They are, uh, they're, uh, and they, they, they join each other. Uh, and so that's uh, really, really important, I think. I think what is the whole, the whole thing that's going on here, I think, is, uh, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, what a teacher alone can do in a classroom, like, and, and that equals a one, and that's the success. It's too bad that the success rate in our little project is only 54 percent. You wish it were higher. But if you add, if you add another person to this mix uh, with a different expertise level, and then you're starting to put puzzle pieces together. And what really starts to happen is that one plus one equals three, not two. 
because you're getting the mentors start bouncing off each other. Students start to take more ownership of their own learning. And so the result is more than uh, you had in the past. And so I think the flat co-taught learning experience is really something that ought to be in the repertoire of every school. As long as we do have brick and mortar schools, we, and particularly in online education, a lot of times there's just what? There's just one mentor. I mean, the package is there. All the mentor does, you know, my grandson, he uh, had to complete a financial literacy course online. Um, he was uh, very conscientious. It was, uh, he just did the work. It was horrible. He hated it, but he just did the work. His friend found out that in the online, uh, the same course, that it didn't matter the mentor who was grading it, supposedly, uh, didn't even, wasn't even looking at anything. Uh, so he just would write, uh, Mary Jane went to the park to do something, and, and he pass that in and he'd get an A. And so, you know, it was not being mentored at all. So he just, that's the way he got through the class. So, um, you know, I think there's a whole different world of using technology in new ways, uh, adult mentors in new ways. And uh, I'm just, uh, in my own classes, I see the results every semester compared to the results I had 10 years ago when I didn't have all the tools that I have now. Questions? We're about out of time, but we have a little time. So if you have a question for David, uh, you can click on the talk button. We've given you all microphone privileges, and feel free to just grab the mic and ask a question. Uh, or you can put a question in the chat. David, are you familiar with um, Sugata Mitra's experiments with the kiosks in India? where just by adding a uh, young woman who had no expertise in the subject matter but just facilitated uh, the students significantly increased their learning? I, I sure am. And uh, he keeps uh, working on this idea of just putting a tool out there and letting kids try to figure it out. And uh, I, I do believe that there's possibilities. Uh, with that, and of course he demonstrates that, but he doesn't uh, demonstrate it uh, for the entire village. He he sees that happen in a few students uh, that that are in the village, and uh, you know any technique that we use, not only the ones I've talked about, but any other technique, will reach a certain uh, number of learners at a certain depth level. So I think. Uh, I, Yes, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, I have uh, teacher librarians, uh, one I'm thinking of in New York, that, that has this I team. And she's got 75 young middle schoolers who have this problem of testing out all kinds of technology and spreading it throughout the school. And so they are, they are wonderful. They, to get on the team, she has a waiting list. She has 75 in the club. She has a waiting list a mile long, and you have to be a great student. I, 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 no, you're not a geek. Anybody with any kind of ability can be on it, even, even a disabled kid. But what you have to do is you have to have your homework done, and you have to be a model student in the school, and then you're, you're into this club where you, where you learn technologies yourself, and then you spread them throughout the school, and you are the, the tech squad. and um, and you teach teachers, and you teach your fellow kids, and you man the genius bar, and all kinds of stuff. So uh, uh, there's a hundred techniques to do all this, but it's all about the self-directed learner and getting a higher percentage of kids to be self-directed learners than we've had in the past. Because we, we've got to have a lot more inventors, and we've got to have a lot more out-of-the-box thinkers if we're going to keep this whole thing going. So we have just a couple of minutes left. If you have a question for David, please feel free to grab the microphone. Click on the Talk button underneath the, in the audio video box where you can put a note in the chat. I guess what I was interested in, David, were the 
the, he goes through a similar process where he identifies that the students, this is Sugatamitra, learn a certain amount on their own, but just through the introduction of a caring young adult who's not a content expert, there's again this sort of dramatic increase in learning. That, and that's true. And of course, all teachers understand that too, don't they? That if they if they uh, really uh, encourage students uh, all they can, they get they get more work uh, as long as the kid believes them. And uh, but yes, uh, he he's famous for the grandmothers, the English grandmothers, who just stand back and say, "Oh, you're doing such wonderful work," and that kind of spurs them on. And that's of course a, a good part of motivation. Uh, but uh, you'll get just as much or uh, much more, I think, with the content. And uh, you know, if you're trying to build an airplane, uh, you got to have more, and you don't know much about aerodynamics. You got to have somebody more than a grandmother helping you. Uh, but uh, a grandmother always helps, right? <laughs> anyway. If I think about my own experiences uh, in soft direction. It makes me wonder if there's an inherent tension between um, sequential curricular expectations and self-direction. I find that for myself, self-direction involves a lot of kind of freedom to think and explore independently. How does that kind of work? Well, every kid needs to come into command of their own learning, and that's why I know schools in the Maryland High School, I ran into a kid who was taking a self-directed course. And he was in charge of his own learning. So that school had figured out that there's not only the, the, the scheduled classes that you have, but you have to provide time and a, and a place for the independent self-directed learner who already is coming into command of their own learning. In other schools, I know that uh, you'll have eight or ten uh, learners together, and each of them are on their own projects. And every Friday they meet and report to each other on the progress they're making. I think you know to have one plan of schooling now is becoming very obsolete. And that the more self-directed, you know, there are some kids that are not self-directed, but could learn it. And those are the ones you want to, uh, you know, you want to find the Steve Hargadons and turn them loose and uh, see what you get. And you're going to get something that's absolutely fabulous, at least in the case of Steve. Huh? Oh, you're always so complimentary. David, thank you very much. We've got another keynote coming up in three minutes. I think we'll give people a chance to take a short break. I'm going to clap for you. I really appreciate that you are front and center here as we're looking at, at learning across the different arenas. And I uh, sure uh, appreciate you and your work. Thank you so much. You bet. And uh, uh, congratulations on your series, and good night. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Amy has put a link in the chat to the next session, which is Cindy Mediavia. And uh, it's learning by doing. Great follow-up to this session. And I'm going to turn the recorder off.